I, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so we somehow perfectly ended the prediction thing last time, and so now we can um, go into inter an introduction to hierarchical modeling. And so there's a whole chapter in Hoff on this that I won't necessarily be following perfectly, but um, okay. And so, um, and hi hierarchical modeling is one of one of the big the big advantages of, of Bayesian um, methods. Though there's a lot of frequentist methods as well, and and really we we have some problems often where the data are grouped. And so you might have, in the classical case, you might have students within schools. So that's sort of a really simple um, setting to think about where we have a bunch of students in the classroom or within a school. And it might be that students within a school um, are correlated with each other. And so we don't want to assume um, IID models or even conditionally IID, uh, conditionally on known covariates, because there might be a lot of things about the school that we haven't measured. And so there might be unmeasured things about the school that we can incorporate in our model that, that would induce dependence among the students um, through something called a random effect. And so there might be a school-specific parameter in our model that allows a shift for a particular school relative to the other schools. And it would be the same thing for patients within hospitals. It's the same thing if you have uh, multiple observations on a given patient and we want to allow variation among the patients. And so hierarchical model is a very nice way um, to allow this sort of cluster dependent structure. Yeah, and you could, you could really do an estimation separately in each group. Um, and so you could say, well, let's just say that everything's totally different in, in this school than in other school, but we might not have very much data um, in, in a given school. And you might want to also do inferences on the overall population of schools and of students. And so that would be a really bad idea to just separately um, fit a model or do an est estimation completely separately in each group. It would be both inefficient and also um, not really necessarily get at the inferences you're interested in. Okay? Um, so that's that point there. So hierarchical models are also called multi-level models, and they really provide a really nice way to take advantage of that information. Okay? So you're sort of shrinking or combining borrowing information across schools um, through a hierarchical model by saying that, well, maybe these school-specific parameters are all drawn from some common distribution that might have an unknown mean and variance that you can actually learn from the data across the different schools. And, and if, there's, if it looks like, based on the data, there's not much variation among the schools, then we would borrow information really strongly in estimating these school-specific effects. Whereas if there's a ton of heterogeneity among the schools, we should be able to figure that, that based on the data and borrow information less across the different schools. Okay, and so in, when we're doing this, when we're going from simple models like just Gaussian models or linear regression models to, to hierarchical models, it, it's going to be much harder to choose a conjugate prior for everything. We can choose maybe conditionally conjugate priors, which will lead to a simple Gibbs sampler, um, but, but it's going to be hard to choose conjugate priors for everything. Okay, and so let's, um, let's just start out with a, a simple cases and kind of describe what a hierarchical model is and, and some of the details and, and going through inferences. Okay, and so um, the school testing example is maybe the easiest one to think about. So let's just say we test students at J different high schools. Um, and in each school, J, and there's, there's cap J schools, little J is indexing the school. We, we get a random sample of N, 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 J students, okay? And so now we don't just have sample size N, which is the number of students overall. We have um, students are nested within schools, and so we have, we have a sample size that's specific to each of these schools, okay? 
And so then for each school J, let's say we don't have any covariates or anything. We're just, we're just getting a, a test score for, for each student. Um, and we could then say, well, the average test score in school J is mu J. And, and sigma J squared is the, the variation in the test scores for students in school J. Okay? And you could potentially imagine that. That not that the, the mean vary, might vary across schools, and so if you're a high performing school, you might have a, a higher mu j than, than another school that was lower performing. And we might also potentially even have the variances um, vary across schools. So often in hierarchical modeling, we might assume that the that, that the variation among um, students within a school might be might be fixed across schools, but the the means might vary. That would be true in most of the simple hierarchical models. Okay, and so let, let's let, just for some notation, so our data are just um, yij, um, and so we just have replicates of different student test scores within school j, and so we can take the average within school j and just call that y bar. That's the average test score in school j, and sj squared would just be the sample variance in school j, and so that would be just like if we were going to do some very simple analysis within school j by itself, and we wanted to just get the sufficient statistics for a, a Gaussian model where the model were just like the students in school J or just IID from normal mu sigma squared. And, and we'd like to get the sufficient statistics for that model. We can get the sample mean. We can get the, um, the sample variance. Okay. And that would just be done separately within each school. And then maybe we can use, just keep track of that data and then use that data in our, in our hierarchical model to build up a posterior. Those in J's yeah. don't necessarily have to be equal values. No, so definitely not. And so, um, so you don't need a sort of balanced design at all. And so the NJ's can be totally different. Okay. And so, um, yeah, this is the model I just mentioned. And so we just say that, that, that we, this is a YIJ. That's the I student in school J, their test score. Um, UJ is the, uh, the school specific average. Um, sigma j squared is a school specific variance, and the simplest model is a normal model. Let's just say they're all normal, um, but then the, the, the normal is sort of shifted across the school. And so um, if you were in a very affluent um, um, neighborhood, it might be that there's more, uh, the kids get more support from the parents, and there, there's more high achieving kids, and then maybe it costs a lot of money to get in the school district, and, and you end, end up getting maybe a more homogeneous group of, of high achievers. Um, in other places, you might have a more heterogeneous group, um, and so, but maybe the mean's a little lower and the variance is higher. Okay? So you, you could characterize that um, with a sort of a, a prior on these means and variances, potentially. Um, a, a, a simple Bayesian analysis would just treat all the schools separately and choose independent priors for mu and sigma uh, j squared. Like we could have a, a, a normal inverse gamma prior, which would be a conjugate prior jointly, and we could choose that independently for each school, but that would be a bad idea because we wouldn't be borrowing information at all. And so we don't want to choose an independent prior in this case. Because the whole point is to borrow information and understand the heterogeneity among different schools. Okay, and so um, if we just did classical inference for each school, um, we could just uh, use large, large sample frequentist asymptotics and just say, oh, well, um, let's get a confidence interval for each school, and we could report this. You know, they keep track of school uh, standardized test performance, and, and each school will even be um, ranked relative to the other schools, and if you're doing that, you, you'd like to get a confidence interval or some measure of uncertainty, and so we could just say, oh, we just have y bar for that school plus or minus 1.96 times the, um, the, the, the standard deviation, um, and so we have the square root sj squared divided by mj, okay? And, um, okay, and so if you use a Bayesian inference with non-informative priors, um, so a non-informative prior, we could choose a, a normal inverse gamma prior for, for mu j and sigma, sigma j squared, and take the limit as n goes to, as the, the variance, prior variance goes to infinity, and, and you end up getting um, uh, Jeffrey's prior, and so under Jeffrey's prior, it's really going to be that the, uh, the posterior 95% credible interval um, looks a lot like this. Okay? Um, I think it's exactly that. And, and so that um, we, we could get the same inferences under a Bayesian or a classical approach in this case, but in either of these approaches, we're not 
we're not using any of the data from the other schools to tell us something about this school J, which is a bad idea. Okay, and so so hierarchical model, what what you would do is you, you would you would have a a more informed prior on each of the mu J's. Okay, and so you could you could in, in, instead this is where the hierarchy comes in. You would you would conceive of the schools as a random sample from all possible schools. Okay, and so we we could say well the mu J's that's a school specific mean. Well, we could think of just some big population of schools. And so these mu j's are drawn from some population distribution. Okay, and that might e that might even be normal, centered on mu, with some other variance. And so you, you end up with this two level. That's why that's why they're called multi level models or hierarchical models, where you, you have a variation among students within the school, um, and that's that's sort of the the simple the simple part of it. And then we now now need to link schools together, allow variation among the population of schools, and we do that by by putting a hierarchical model, say, on the means. We draw the mu j's from, from a common distribution. Okay, and so that's called a hierarchical or random effect model. And so we could say that, that mu naught might be the overall mean of all schools, the, the average test score across all schools, and um, tau is the variance of, of all schools' average scores. Okay. And so then we could do this. And so we, we think of the each mu j as coming from a common prior distribution, a random effects distribution. And so frequentists actually fit hierarchical models all the time, um, even though it's really intrinsically a Bayesian idea in some sense, um, to, to say that we have some parameters that are drawn from some common prior. Uh, but we could still, we could use maximum likelihood estimation to estimate the parameters in the resulting model. But we would say that the, the prior, or mu j, um, Conditionally, on the hyperparameters mu naught and tau squared, these are just IID, um, conditionally independent given these hyperparameters from a from a common normal distribution. Okay. And so, if you had um, as as tau gets um, small, what does that mean? If tau is pretty small, schools are pretty similar. So the schools are pretty similar. Okay. So that means that in terms of average test scores, the schools are very similar if tau is small. If tau, as tau gets bigger, the schools become very, more and more variable because we're sampling the means from um, they're going to be all over the place. And so we get these sort of, uh, you can think of this as a sort of a variance component model. We get different components of variation. We get, we get variation among schools, um, which is controlled by this tau squared. And, and we also have the sigma j squares. That's controlling variation within the school. Okay? And so we might, usually we might expect there might be more variation among students within a school than between schools. But if you have very, very disparate um, schools, that might not necessarily be the case. Okay, and so then we could, uh, if we're going to do Bayesian inference here, you, you really a fundamental part of the problem is sort of inferring mu naught. That might be what, one of the main things we're interested in, and tau squared and the sigma j's. And so we don't really want to, um, we don't want to fix these in advance. That's a really bad idea. We, we'd like to put priors on them. Okay, and so we, there are, our parameters in this hierarchical model. Um, the sort of population level parameters, those are going to be these sigma j squared, the mu naught, and the tau squared. Okay? And so we could, we could really marginalize out this, the, the, the mu j's and have some big normal model across the different schools for all the data, and then the parameter is marginalizing out the random effects, so it's going to be sigma, the sigma j's, and, and we could often use that as the same, but you don't have to. The mu, mu, mu naught and the tau squared. Okay. And so, so now initially we're going to pre pretend that, that these are um, fixed just for purposes of, of showing some equations and, and getting some insight into how exactly the barring of information occurs. And so if we have, if we have this, then what intuitively is happening? Let's say, let's say I'm really interested in the performance in Riverside or something, some school in Durham, and, and I have mu, so that's mu3. I'm really interested in that. Um, but I, I have data not just from that school, I have data from other schools um, in, in the local area. Okay? And so if I have this type of prior, intuitively what will happen is, well, I might be interested in the posterior distribution of, of mu j, but so should I just use data from Riverside? Well, really, um, mu j is, is sort of dependent on the other mu j, mu j through this model, this prior. And so that sort of implies that the, the, the average test scores in the other schools might be informative about my UJ. 
Okay, and so that's that's how the barring of information occurs. We're not just using data from the test scores from that J school in isolation. We're, we're barring information from other schools, and so that barring is like really key and, and incredibly useful in a huge variety of applications that are much more complicated than schools. Okay, and so let's let's just go through a little bit of this fun math and. Um, and, and see, see what happens. And so we can find the posterior distribution for each mu j given all of the test score data, and we could just call that just the cap y. And so this is the joint posterior distribution of, of the school specific means. And for now, we're conditioning on these sort of IP parameters where we condition on the data, but also the, um, the average, the overall mean across schools, the school specific variances, and the variance among the um, the, the school. So the, the, these these are controlling the variation among students within a school. This is controlling the variation across schools. Okay, and it's just a it's just a normal model, and so the the the, the likelihood just looks like this. It's just we take a product across all the different schools. Okay, and then and then we have a, a, a school specific normal. Okay, and so that that's easy. And then and then we also have this pri the prior for all the different mu j's. And so the prior for the different mu j's, that's, that's all we, they're just conditionally independent given u naught. They're definitely not largely independent, but they're conditionally independent given u naught and, and these other hyperparameters. And so, so this product, this includes this guy. Okay? And so if we, um, if we just look at each mu j one at a time, because this thing actually factorizes, um, because all the mu j's are actually um, they're, they're actually a, a posteriori um, independent as well, and, and then we just get this thing that looks a lot like the, the same type of algebra we go over in doing sort of normal normal kind of updating of, of posterior distributions. And so we just pull out the um, the likelihood component for the j school, and, and, and then we pull out the, the sort of prior for mu j, um, and we go through that, and then and so then if we just um, do simple stuff, then then the conditional posterior distribution, which might be really useful in Gibbs sampling and also gives us some insight into the barring of information, but the conditional posterior distribution of mu j given everything else is just the normal, okay? And then, uh, let's look at the variance here. So the variance is um, 1 over nj plus um, nj over sigma j squared plus 1 over tau squared, okay? So if, if, what, would, what would that variance be? If we weren't doing um, a random effects model, but we were just doing things independently within each school, not borrowing information at all, just using Jeffrey's prior. So I showed that a little earlier. So what's that variance going to be like intuitively? I mean, you just take this guy out, okay? And so um, you take that out, so it's just going to be sigma j squared over nj, okay? And so then the posterior standard deviation will be the square root of that. And so then if we get a credible interval, it'll be like that plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of that. And so we would get exactly the 95% um, um, confidence region that you get in not barring information. But, but we have this other information because of the joint prior. And so, um, so actually, you can also see there's another way to look at it, um, which is to take what would happen as, um, as we took our normal prior um, our, our random effects distribution that's normal, and let's just say let's say we we blew up tau squared, we made it really big. If we made tau squared really big, then what's this prior going to be? Yeah, it's going to be like the same as in that Jeffrey's case. It seems to be proportional to a constant, and and then and then what happens in this um, conditional posterior distribution is that oh well this is going to infinity, and so that's just, that, that's zero, and then you just get the same thing as before. So you get no barring of information. It's a random effects distribution that the variance in the school specific means becomes very big. We get no barring of information. Of course, that's ridiculous in practice because there's, there's only going to be so much variation of, across schools in the average performance. So in practice, we're going to we might borrow quite a bit, but as we get more and more data from a, a given school, um, this is going to get washed out. Um, so that's the variance. That's our variance in uj. Um, what about the mean? So this is our, our improved, hopefully improved estimate of 
of the 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 average uh, performance in in Riverside. Okay. Um, so what the the naive estimate would just be y um, bar j. That would be the average test scores among students in Riverside. And so the improved um, powerful modeling estimate um, is is putting a weight of um, n j over sigma j squared um, on on that y bar, and then it's taking a weighted average of, of y bar with the overall population mean. Okay. And so the effect of that is going to be if we have variation among the schools, if Riverside is, is really low, it might just be because, well, we might not get data from that many students in Riverside who were the grade of the, that we were looking at for that test. And, and they might, might have had just, um, you know, randomly sort of had poor performance that year. And, and so the right thing to do is sort of um, is to pull them back a little bit to, towards the average across students from all schools. And the amount we pull them back is sort of um, dependent on the um, depending on how variable that random effects distribution is. If it's very variable, then we don't pull them back much at all because another school wouldn't tell us much about the performance of the students in Riverside. Okay. Are there any questions on that? Or? This hierarchical modeling stuff is very, very important, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, I probably said this already, but the posterior mean from UJ is a weighted average of the sample mean and the, 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 the mean of the random effects distribution. Um, okay, so the, 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 almost always in, in random effects models we make this assumption, which may or may not be reasonable in a lot of cases, um, but to simplify things, we might say that the variation among students within a school is the same across schools. If you think about the school example, it's probably a really bad assumption. If you look at like some sort of private, maybe a private school, um, there may be less variance than the sort of a uh, an urban public school, for example. And so that might be a bad assumption, but let's just say we do that. Then, then the schools with the smaller n, n, nj, they have estimated mu j's closer to mu naught than the schools with the larger numbers of individuals. They're, they're shrunk back more. So we have, if we have a tiny school and we've averaged test scores for five students, then it might be that that, that, that the posterior mean for our, our expectation of that student performance in that school is it actually maybe closer to mu naught than, than the average across five students. Okay, so this is called shrinking, and so we have we have like something empirical y bar j, and we're shrinking it back towards this um, overall mean mu naught. Okay, and so shrinking or shrinkage um, is. Um, it's a very, very common thing that's very, very useful in lots of applications. And, and the prior sort of has the shrinkage effect. Okay, so there, there's, been, there's a really rich literature on, um, on hierarchical modeling. And so, so Brad Efron, who's amazingly still active, um, sort of an energetic super genius, and, and Car at Stanford and Carl Morris, who, who's also still um, Still doing research at Harvard, had a very influential early work on on empirical bays and hierarchical modeling, and so they some of these guys, these old guys, kind of like baseball data for some reason. <laughs> um, I think like a lot of statistics and somebody wrote a, a textbook on like with all baseball examples. It's like a <laughs> so you teach like an introductory stat course and you have nothing but baseball examples. <laughs> Seems like a really bad idea. Um, okay. I, baseball is terribly boring. Um, <laughs> and so they look at sample battle, batting average for 18 baseball players over the first 45 at bats. I might not even use this example, but I started on the notes like 20 minutes before class, and, and these are uh, notes from Jerry Ryder. So, <laughs> so they looked at the sample batting average for 18 baseball players over the first 45 at bats. And that's not very many baseball players, clearly. And so, um, and baseball batting averages, that, that you don't have a lot of information. Um, because it's sort of a, a, a Bernoulli thing. You either, hit, you either get a hit or not. Okay. So you're not going to have a good estimate of their, their batting average long term based on 45 at bats. And so they wanted to um, estimate or predict the batting averages at the end of the year. And so this would be really important if you were like a, a, a general manager of a baseball team um, and you wanted to predict the, bat, the, the performance over time, then, then that would be important. Okay. And so we'd like to predict at the end of the year. And so you could use a, 
you could just take the raw batting average, which could be one of the games you play, you take the raw batting average, and you see if that's sort of closer than doing a hierarchical thing. And almost, almost surely it, it won't be. I mean, the hierarchical thing will beat it. I mean, the hierarchical models work great, and that's why they're so popular. But let's see what ha how it happens. It'll surprise me, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> they wanted to estimate the actual batting average at the end of the year. And so that's based on a lot of at-bats if the player survives that long. OK, so let's use a hierarchical model. And so the, um, I'll put the data in the core, the core data sets. It's also, these, available, these, da these are a very famous uh, data set that's available online. OK, so let's let yj be the number of hits in 45 at-bats um, for player j. Okay. And so if, if, we, if we, um, we might just assume they're, they're independent, people are actually, um, there's a whole literature on these types of things, which I don't know why I know that, but um, the uh, <laughs> sports statistics is maybe not a big interest of mine. But, um, the, in terms of whether there's streakiness or not. And so you're batting, um, and then, oh, well, I, I just hit it five times in a row, and then I missed ten times in a row. Is there actually something like streakiness? Well, I'm, now I'm like on a, on a hot streak, and then I'm, I'm, when I shoot the ball, it's going in every time. And so there's some debate, actually, whether or not that's true. And there, there, my recollection is there's not a lot of evidence of, uh, in terms of streakiness that people will look at the data because they'll look at some outliers. You know, if you just generate independent Bernoulli trials, um, you're gonna, and then you look at it after the fact. Particularly somebody who just uh, did had some amazing shot, and he hit ten in a row, or somebody might have missed twenty in a row. Um, then, then you can see evidence for streakiness after the fact. But if you just take the data as a whole and try to test for it, then there's not so much evidence. Okay, and so let's say we just do say it's independent. Okay, so we're just saying that. Yj, that, this is just a binomial proportion thing, and so it's just binomial. The the, the, the probability you hit is um, is pi j. The reason that this is an oversimplification, though, is that the pitchers um, make a big difference um, in, in the batting um, in the batting success. So there's a side comment. We actually have a paper where you where you I, I don't like baseball, but the um, where you look at pitchers versus batters. Uh, over time, it's sort of relational data, and then you have data from like because baseball, they, they publish all this data online, and so you can you can interpolate and you can say, well, how would a modern batter um, do against a, a pitcher from 30 years ago? So, things like that. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so let's assume that the players um, the pi j is a random sample from the distribution of all possible batting averages. And so how how are we going to build a hierarchical model here? Does anyone? What's the natural thing to do? Yeah, we're going to put a prior on the pi j's, and so we have pi j's for each of our bunch of our players in our sample. So what that what's that prior going to look like? Just a, the, in general, I mean, it's going to be. I mean, it's a beta. beta. Yeah, probably like a beta or something, or or you could transform it and make it normal or something. We we just want some sort of population distribution. And there's going to be an average, and we're shrinking towards the average. So we need some sort of population distribution. Uh, uh, um, describing variation among players and their batting averages. Okay, and so we we could even like um, use some sort of informed um, prior potentially. And so you know, for historical records of batting averages, maybe they're around 0.268. I think there's probably been some trends in the batting averages, obviously over time. But you could potentially, as a simple guess, use this historical average and, and then um, and the historical variance as well. Okay. Yeah, so we use a beta. It's a binomial, so we can just use the conjugate beta. And so, actually, in this case, it, let's say we use the historical record. And so we have pi k. Well, they're just drawing all, they're all drawing iid from the common beta distribution. And, and we kind of, we know what the mean is. We kind of know what the standard deviation is. So what would be a really simple thing to do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we 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 have a beta. We have some beta. We might say that the pi j's are drawn from beta a b, and now we want we want to move around a and b to to sort of to, to, to match this. And so we could make it like either the mode or the mean is is 0.268, and we could make the standard deviation 0.04 easily by just just choosing an a and b consistent with those values, and then and then the random effects distribution would be fixed. And, 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 and the 
posterior distribution for each of the pi j's is also going to be beta. It's just conjugate under that beta common beta prior, and then everything's really simple. Okay. And so that I actually did something similar. Um, I was uh, doing this perchlorate risk analysis for EPA, and so they, they they were doing all this testing of missiles, and and they wanted to see whether or not these missile testing out in the West they would. They would shoot off a missile and it would land and it would blow, blow up and then there's all this stuff left over and it would rain and then this, this stuff left over from the missiles would get washed into the groundwater and something that was it a lot in the groundwater in the west was uh, perchlorate salts um, and so the question, is, there was a lot of concern in the community that this perchlorate salt stuff was, was causing nasty effects but then the military doesn't want to stop the testing and so the EPA ran a bunch of studies and where they would um, expose um, rodents to perchlorate salts and, and what, what they saw in the sort of long-term studies is nothing going on but they had, because there was a kind of tiny sample size but they, they saw in, a, in, in an intermediate study in a, in a short-term study they actually saw like two out of the 30 animals um, got a thyroid tumor um, and, and zero out of the, who were exposed to perchlorate, and zero out of the 30 animals um, um, in the control group got thyroid tumors. Okay, and so that wouldn't be significant because it's just a tiny, um, uh, tiny numbers, and so oh, it's not significant. But if you go back to the historical records, they've actually they run these studies all the time on rats to see how many tumors they have. There's like 5,000 animals in the historical database in the control group. None of them has ever gotten a thyroid tumor, <laughs> and so um, and so if you put that in your prior, then all of a sudden it becomes enormously, hugely significant. Um, and so yeah, so we we got this like gold medal from the EPA for doing this, <laughs> kind of funny. but but the uh, it was extremely unpleasant because um, I had to go like testify, and and they had this big this big room, and there's this general standing up there, and the, and they hired this um, statistician who was like an expert at pulling people apart. He completely, <laughs> he completely annihilated me. He just like, he just he got up there and he just tore me to shreds. It was just like, oh well, you would have never looked at this in advance, and you're doing post hoc testing, and but we can always look at a million different things and get things that are significant. And anyway, um, <laughs> it was very unpleasant. But that's a sidebar, maybe. Someone more interesting than batting averages, but it's the same. It's the same type of thing. You're putting a beta prior on within, within in a Bernoulli. Okay, so let's do the the batting averages thing. Okay, so the data are binomial, so we're going to do a conjugate beta prior for the second level model. And so we want to have we want to have let's say the mean. So the mean of the beta is a over a plus b. We have a beta a b prior. And so we want to have the mean as point um, two six eight. Okay, and so that's the long-term average, batting averages in a historical database, which we can easily get. It's online. Um, and we can also get the variance. So we want the variance, say, which for a beta is this uh, somewhat complicated expression, but not that bad. And we want that as um, um, 0.04 squared, because 0.04 is the standard deviation. Okay, and so you can, you can solve for A and B. You have, um, you have a, a two equations and two unknowns. It's slightly nonlinear, but you can still solve it very easily. And then you get A is um, 32.6 and B is um, 89. And so, so what's our prior sample size? Do people remember that? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the prior sample size is A plus B. And so that's the sort of amount of information in the prior that we have in terms of like players <laughs> that are in our prior. And so that's actually quite pretty smallish, you know. It's, um, a little over 100, it's 100 and whatever it is, 20 something. And so um, that's our prior sample size. In my rat example, I had like a prior sample size of like um, thousands of these rats. So I, I actually diluted the, um, the variance somewhat to allow for the fact that the current study might not be exactly the same from the exactly the same distribution. But yeah, so we have a pretty, pretty modest prior sample size. Um, but the reason for that is, what, what's the reason for that is, um, is that we, we don't really have all the players are exchangeable. We're trying to estimate one batting average for everyone. We're trying to estimate player-specific batting averages. And so this, um, this variance, even if we had 100 billion years of data, 
Um, that doesn't mean that this variance is going to go to zero because this is getting out the variation among players. And so it doesn't matter how much data we get, there's still some underlying variation among players which is captured by this 0.04. Okay, so we get this beta distribution. And, um, you know, as we went over very early in the class when we were doing IID things and beta Bernoulli's and things, um, it's really, really easy to get the, uh, the posterior. And so that's just going to be, um, that's going to be uh, the, the number of um, successes we had, the number of times the, uh, player J hit the ball, um, plus that A in our beta prior, and then um, that, that, the, the, the number of, um, let's see if the, we do the the B plus um, the number of failures. I mean, we get the we get the, the total minus the number of. I, I usually write it as um, usually write it as as B plus the number of times the player misses the ball. Okay. So if you do B plus the number of times the player missed the ball, then you get um, then you get this one. Okay. And so let's uh, let's look at the inferences, and we can compare it against the truth at the end of the year. So what what's doing that? What are we doing then? If we're if we're if we're comparing against the truth at the end of the year, we're doing yeah we're doing we're doing cross validation. We're doing out of sample prediction. And so we take a tiny bit of data at the beginning of the year. And, and based on that, we fit our hierarchical model, and now we're predicting um, we're predict predicting what happens by the end of the year, which is like a lot more data, and that's their sort of test data, stuff that happens um, later on. Okay. And so, um, so it was pretty revolutionary, and, and that it sort of uh, stimulated a lot of interest in hierarchical models. This um, Efron and Morris work. Um, because the hierarchical model was closer to the truth than the sample averages. And so, you know, um, I, I assume the baseball people are quite savvy about statistics and they're probably using Bay Bayesian methods quite a bit. And so, yeah, we get for 13 to the 18 players. If we just look at the posterior mean, um, okay, and so you can, you can prove that quite easily if, if the, the truth are generated from this very simple simple model, um, you can prove on average that the posterior means for the hierarchical model with known hyperparameters, if you actually know the truth, that's going to be closer to the truth than the MLEs. That's pretty pretty obvious, I think. If you, I mean, if you know exactly what the population distribution is. It becomes much more difficult if you to prove such a thing if you don't know what the population is. Um, and of course, in most applications, um, except for this baseball example and that perchlorate example, um, we don't really know what A and B are going to be, or the A and B in the, in the, in the uh, where we have a hierarchical model for probabilities, or mu naught and tau when we have a hierarchical model for continuous things. And so we, we put hyper priors on those quantities, and, and we would run MCMC, and we wouldn't be able to do this exact, these exact calculations. Okay. And so, um, so, so we're going to fuse two classes into one, and we're going to talk about that today. <laughs> You guys aren't asking enough questions. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's go back to the school example. Why are we going back to the school example? Because if we do a beta and we have A and B, and we try to put hyper priors on things. It's like the math doesn't fall out very nice, and we don't have a simple Gibbs sampler, and so we we'll do the normal instead. Okay, and so let's let's um, let's do the simplification that that people pretty much always do, which is the variances are the same. Potentially, you could have a fancy model where, where the variances are actually also sampled from a population distribution. Um, that, and so you could borrow information about the variances. People basically never do such things, but you could do that. Okay, and so if we, if we look at Haas chapter 8 and we replace um, um, a mu naught with mu in our notation, that, then we just have this. This is where the higher you can see very concisely a, high, a hierarchical model. And so we have. Um, this is the model for the data within a school, conditional on the school-specific mean and the variation among students within a school. And then we, we go up one level in the hierarchy, and then we have the, the mu j's given mu and tau, or they're just sampled from another normal distribution. Okay? And um, in general, you could write any sorts of all sorts of levels. You could have students nested within classrooms as well, and then there'd be another level. Okay, and so now we're going to say, like, um, the parameters are all unknown. That's the truth, really. And so we don't know what any of these things are, really. And so we'd like to maybe do Gibbs sampling. 
Um, and so we could choose just simple priors for things and then, um, and then try to derive the full conditional distributions and run Gibbs anyway. And so we have um, all of these things are unknown, and so we need to choose priors for them. And so it, and ha I, I often call these um, conditionally conjugate priors, but um, Hoth likes to call them semi-conjugate priors. Um, it doesn't really matter to the notation, but um, terminology. So we could just say the mu, the, so this is the population average to mean that the overall test score among everyone across all schools, that's, um, we could, we can just say that that's drawn from a normal distribution. And, and these are maybe our parameters that we actually listed. Okay, so we're, we're going to actually fix these in advance. Sort of, it's related to the question last time. It's like, where do we draw the line and draw? And we could put hyperpriors on these, but there's no information in the data really to inform those hyperpriors. Whereas there's information, a lot of information in the data about mu and sigma squared and tau. And so let's. Let's use the fact that we know something about the test. It might even be some standardized test where you know a lot about mu naught and, 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 and sigma naught squared. So we listed those, and then conditional now we have some unknown mean of the random effects distribution. And then for the precision um, within and across schools, we just choose gamma priors. Okay? So that's the obvious um, conditionally conjugate choice. It may be not a very good choice, particularly in hierarchical models, as we will. Um, be discussing as we proceed, probably not today. So mu naught's the best guess of the average of school, um, average of test scores across schools. Um, we, we might not know it very well, and so we could put a range of values. And so I don't. Uh, what's the a plausible value for the test, the average across schools? We could say, oh well, it's between this and this, and then we could choose those as sort of. Um, the interquartile range or something for a normal distribution, and then choose the variance based on that. And um, yeah, and so we can similarly, it's the same game for for tau naught squared. It's just um, whether it's you know um, sigma squared is controlling the is the variance. Um, gamma naught squared is controlling our uncertainty in the overall mean across all the schools, whereas um, tau naught squared is controlling our, our, our sort of guess on the, the variation across schools, okay, in the, the average performance. Okay, and so n naught is another one of these prior sample size things, which is set based on how, how tight um, or how informative our prior is um, for tau squared around tau naught squared. Okay. So we probably, in this case, actually, you have uh, people just repeatedly apply tests over and over and over again, and you apply tests across the whole country, and you're apply, uh, constantly applying similar tests, and so you probably have a pretty darn good idea about these hyperparameters in most cases, um, though you could potentially choose a, a prior that was uh, maybe a little weaker that, than your actual prior information. Um, for sake of robustness, because we, we don't want to, if we have a prior that's very informative and we, it's actually slightly misspecified, we might, might not do as well. And so we might slightly inflate the variance around what we think it is in doing this. Okay, and so we can we could choose all these things. Um, often in practice, people, people try to choose more of a, a default specification, but we're going to do better definitely if we think carefully about the data we have and what plausible ranges are and we do sort of proper prior elicitation. Okay, so let's, um, let's give an example. So let's, uh, let's say it's an SAT score and so we, we believe the overall average on the test is a thousand points and so then we would set mu naught equals a thousand. And um, we're not really sure that that should be the overall average across the population of schools and students that we're considering. And so, but it might make a lot of sense to say it's between 900 and 1100. Okay. And so, um, and we might say, say that, well, it's between 900 and 1100 with some pretty high probability, like 0.95. And then you can, you can back calculate from, from normal um, quantiles and figure out that then the, the variance is uh, sigma naught squared. Okay. And this might be data, I don't know, I think there's been some trend in the, the SAT, they added some other component or something, but when we were taking the SAT, this would be reasonable. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should know these things, my son's going to be taking the SAT. Um, okay, so the, we believe that the standard deviation of the school-wide averages is around 100 points, 
which makes a huge variance. So we set the um, tau naught squared to be 10,000. Um, it would make it somewhat easier to list it even if you um, potentially if you if you put it on a normalized scale. Okay, and so we're 90% sure that the standard deviation is less than 200, um, and so that we can similarly kind of kind of go through and figure out the rest of our hyperparameters. And so this whole process is it's pretty straightforward, but all it sort of illustrates one thing, which is, and you're doing prior elicitation, often you don't know much at all about the actual hyperparameters in the distributions, but you know things about other things. And then you can indirectly infer reasonable values for the hyperparameters in, in your priors based on these other things. And that's usually quite straightforward. So what about default priors? Okay, and so, um, so that might be we, we don't know much about um, what the test score should be, or we might want to do a default analysis for comparison or to maintain some appearance of objectivity in our analysis um, because people might be concerned that what exactly the values we put in for the hyperparameters might be um, driving our inferences somewhat. And so if, if we cho chose a, um, if we just had a simple normal case, like if we just looked at data from one school, we just had one mean and variance, then, then the reference prior, the sort of Jeffrey's prior, um, was just if we let, if we let um, B be the precision, um, we would just be a, a sort of uniform for the mean, and then for the, the precision, we'd have this one over phi, proportional to one over phi. And so that is that proper is a proper prior or an improper prior? It's an improper prior. And what does that mean to to be an improper prior? So so if we if we integrated, so we say, oh well, this is proportional to something, okay? And so if it was if there was a proper distribution for that prior, then if it's proportional to something, well, then how do we find exactly what the prior density is? Well, we take that thing as proportional to, and we divide by the norming constant, which is the integral across the whole range of that thing. And so we integrate that from zero to infinity. Um, and we'd also integrate out mu from minus infinity to infinity. And so we have an integral from minus infinity to infinity, integral from zero to infinity, d phi, d mu, okay? And when we do that, what would, what would happen? It would, it would go to infinity, it would diverge. And, it, 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 and so we, could, we can't, we can't, um, we can't um, divide by normalized and constant to make it as a proper distribution. So the, the distribution's improper, so it's sort of nonsensical. We couldn't do any inferences based on this prior. But when we update data with data, in the, um, in the case where we didn't have a hierarchical model, we just had data from one group, we update with data, then, then we get a proper posterior as long as we have, you know, a couple of students that have taken the test, a few students. If you had no students, it would still be improper. But, yeah. What's a reference prior? Um, a reference prior is just a, just a term for a kind of a, a default non-informative prior. Yeah, people use um, a whole variety of different terms. Yeah, default prior, or non-informative prior, or reference prior. Yeah. And so um, a non-informative prior is, yeah, I mean, so you'd like to, um, the prior, the prior, the sort of default priors have nice properties in terms of, like, if we reparameterize some things, then, then our inferences won't change. Okay. Um, so what, what do we worry about in, in using improper priors? The posterior needs to be proper, or our inferences are completely nonsensical, okay? And so... So when we get into, in, in the models you've been, we've been talking about so far, we're just like a normal or a beta, a beta or we have some sort of regression model or something. Um, usually, unless we're in some weird case, like we have more predictors than sample size or something, um, usually we get a proper posterior under, under improper priors. When we go to hierarchical models, um, you need to be much more careful. And so if we do the stupid thing here, if we... Um, which doesn't seem that stupid. If we if we take these priors and say, oh well, I want a default prior now. I'm going to blow up the variance in all these priors. Then we get an improper posterior. Okay. So we don't want that. Um, so we can choose. We need to be careful. And there, there's a whole series of, of papers in the literature when, when uh, back in the sort of mid '90s when people started um, you know, MCMC has sort of taken off in, in, in the early '90s, and now people are like running with hierarchical models and doing computation. There's a bunch of papers on sort of um, 
showing priors that are nice default priors that, 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 that lead to um, proper posteriors. And perhaps this one where we blow up the variance is not one of those. And, and so, so we can, we can for the, um, say for the, for the variance among kids in, in the school, we, we could potentially use that prior. Okay. And so if we, if we let, um, if we let phi of mu be equal to 1 over tau, and in the hierarchical model, if, if we use um, phi of mu is, is proportional to 1 over phi mu, um, th this is going to result in an improper posterior distribution. Okay. So that was the problem I just mentioned, where if you, you took those priors and you just, you just blew up the variance in a naive way, um, and you got this prior that looked very nice, it looked like a natural, um, improper, non-informative prior extension um, of, of, of the usual, the, the simple normal case to the hierarchical case, um, that actually leads to an improper posterior distribution. And so, but we can do a, um, we can do a slight modification, potentially. And so the, what, what's the reason for this? Well, the, the problem arises right around zero. And so the, the, the data can't really, um, ref, you could say, refute the possibility that, that, that the variance is equal to zero. Okay? And so that results in an in, in infinite integral. And so it, it's actually somewhat of an issue for, for this prior in general. So, um, so if we have the, if we go back to our model, let's go back to our model. And so... So the real problem comes in not, not in the prior for sigma squared, it comes in the prior for, for tau. Okay. And so if we have a prior for, for this tau, um, and, and let's say we have the random, so this is the ra random tau is the random effect standard deviation. If we have the, the, the random effect um, precision, we choose a gamma prior for that, what's the gamma prior going to look like um, as we blow up the variance? It's um, and the sort of gamma prior as we blow up the variance, so the, the precision um, is going to it's going to like it's going to be like this enormous spike. You're thinking of a gamma epsilon epsilon prior as epsilon goes to zero, so the gamma goes to like it takes off like an enormous spike right around zero, and then becomes enormous. Like and so it's like enormously heavy tail, enormous spike right around zero. And so what happens is, um, in, in the limit, you can get an improper posterior. And, so, and, and if you choose the gamma epsilon epsilon prior, um, which is very often done, um, for years the sort of default in, in wind bugs and what everyone was doing was they might choose like gamma 1 times 10 to the minus 6 or something. And so they're like, well, we don't want to choose gamma zero zero, which would be the limiting case, because we get an improper posterior for the random effects precision. And so, well, let's we'll get a, a proper posterior by making the value small. And so that that's always a really bad idea. Um, and so what what happens is um, if if you if you have a, an improper posterior in the limit, it just backing off a little a tiny bit. Um, and saying, okay, well, we're not going to go to the limit. We're going to go close to the limit in some sense. <laughs> that, that, that gives you what's called a near impropriety problem. Okay? And so what will happen is, is your inferences will be incredibly flaky, and your Gibbs sampler will be flaky, and, and bad things happen. And so you don't want to, if in the limiting case you have an improper posterior under that prior, you, you don't want to choose a very, very high variance prior that has a limiting case that's improper. You, you pretty much never want to do that, and, and so this is one example. So the uh, it actually is the case that a, a gamma prior for the random effects precision is a really crappy prior, even though that's the standard prior that um, 95 or more percent of people use. Um, okay, if you choose a no formative um, gamma prior, the, the deal is is different. I think, but if and it's partly just due to the, sort of the geometry. If you reparameterize, you can actually choose a non-informative prior, and you're fine. You can choose an improper prior if you reparameterize um, and, and choose a slightly different um, improper prior. Okay, let's get back up to this. <coughs> and so that that's this problem here. So the because um, for the data, we don't we don't know definitely that that it can't be tau equals zero. Okay, so that would that cause these mu's to all collapse around zero because the mu's aren't tied down by the data. That's really where the problem comes in. 
And then if you just go through the mathematical ex exercise, you can get divergence of these integrals. And so th this is a really important point. So um, if, if, if we use that prior that was actually a crappy prior um, that results in a, a nonsensical posterior, so the posterior doesn't exist, it's improper, it's complete nonsense. We can't base inferences on it, it's just garbage. But we can run GIP sampling. And in fact, um, Allen's um, you know, sort, of, sort of famous paper, Gelfand's famous paper on the GIP sampler, they actually did that. And it was looking good for a while, and then if you ran it longer, it just sort of like floats off to infinity. So, um, so you need to be very, very careful about about these things. There was a joke actually that um, that you know in the mid mid '90s or something, you you could like have just a lay person go into the audience of any talk, Asian talk, and they could just ask a question and sound very deep and say, ask them if their posterior is proper or not, <laughs> because sometimes it's very hard to show, and it's like. Is that a proper posterior? <laughs> so I think that um, they said that it, um, Jim's wife, Anne, used to go to poster sessions and ask everyone if their posterior was proper or not. <laughs> she got some people that were, they, they got very nervous. You know, they didn't know how to answer. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> and, and so some people used to think that, okay, well, I'll drive the full conditional distributions. I can do that easily in this case under these. Um, those priors I initially showed, plugging the variance. And so they all have simple um, full co conditional distributions. They're like, there's some nor uh, two normals and two gammas. Okay, I can easily sample from those. Those are proper distributions. All the conditionals are proper. And so, um, and unfortunately, um, having proper conditional distributions doesn't mean that the joint is proper. And so you can run Gibbs sampling. Um, and, and each of your, your, your conditional distributions is proper, but the joint is improper. Okay, and this is true under this, um, under this random effects model if you choose what seems like the obvious um, default prior. Okay, and so you run it, and what will happen in the GIP sampler? What is it converging to? Well, if you run GIP sampling, what's the, what's the conver the conver what does it converge to? The samples. You're running the samples, and they're converging to... Hopefully, a stationary distribution which corresponds to the joint posterior distribution. Well, the joint posterior distribution doesn't exist, and so the Gibbs sampler will not converge. And so you run it, and it just sort of floats off. It doesn't like it doesn't like go down and settle around somewhere, and then just oscillate around the long-term mean. It will just kind of diverge off into infinity. You know? um, and so maybe it'll look like a random walk or something eventually, just floating off. And so. Um, so that's a problem. Sometimes you don't even necessarily see it, though. If you if you if you run a chain for a thousand or something, you're only updating from the conditionals, and so it doesn't necessarily really rapidly float off. It might might actually be stable for a little while, and then just eventually start to float off. And and, and that's particularly the case in this type of model because because it's almost like the reason it floats off is is right around right around um, tau equals zero. Okay, and so Actually, your data might be pretty far from that, and so you might actually get a settle around, um, settle down in a chain that's like sort of away from tau equals zero, and 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 sort of be happy, and actually sometimes get reasonable results even though the true posterior is complete garbage, and, and you should be getting, um, you will eventually it won't converge to so give sampler, um, yeah, and so that that's often also true for these gamma epsilon epsilon priors. The real problem comes in with the random effects variance is small. Um, and then you can get very unstable results. There's a really beautiful paper by Andrew Gelman, um, which was a discussion of a, of a less interesting paper by David Draper in Bayesian Analysis in 2005, um, which is like really kind of nicely goes into these problems and um, proposes solutions. Gives an example where this gamma epsilon epsilon is very, very flaky, and then he has a very simple alternative, which is giving a prior, a beautiful prior on the standard deviation. Okay, so. Um, so some default improper priors for hierarchical normal models. So these are legit default priors. Okay. And so, um, so for the mean, we could we could just say it's proportional to um, the one. Um, we we could um, we could choose a, a, a normal if we wanted to. Maybe with with delta equals small for, for the for the. Um, 
this is for the, the residual, the, the within student, um, within school variation across students, okay? So that precision, that one we can actually choose as like a gamma epsilon epsilon for. Um, but the, the, the important, the, the more um, flaky parameter is the random effect variance, okay? And so the, the random effect variance, um, one possibility is to choose um, a uniform zero A. Uh, you can also choose the random effect standard deviation to be, um, to be uniform and proper. So that actually works quite well. So th this is what you know um, Jerry um, had had in his notes, and not each person might use some um, uh, different things, and these are totally fine choices. I tend to choose um, either a uniform improper prior, or I don't really like improper priors. I think they're a bad bad idea usually because um, I would like my prior to sort of be shrinking to stabilize things in the absence of much data, so I don't like to choose improper priors. And so um, so Andrew Gelman's uh, idea I think is a is a much much better one as a, as a default prior. Um, slightly more complicated, so we'll be going into, into that in a different lecture. Okay. Um, so it's really common to use um, uh, the, these gamma epsilon epsilon priors. Okay. And so it's a typical specification of wind bugs, which um, which you, you should you should at least be introduced to in the, in the labs um, if you don't know it already. It's a sort of a default kind of CAM software for be, to be doing Bayesian analyses. It's somewhat slow and um, can be slightly flaky. Um, and, and I was just at I was just giving a talk at um, NC State yesterday, and I guess one of the students there is like starting this company where he has this very very fast um, Java program, like alternative to Winbox. And so it, may, it might be that coming down the line, there'll be a better alternative. But but many the many of the flakinesses have been have sort of um, being fixed over time. Okay, and so so the priors. Um, this is the point um, from a different perspective that, that I was making that you have this sort of flakiness of gamma epsilon epsilon um, as epsilon goes to zero and it's a particularly bad problem when the data are consistent with a random effects variance that's small because then you have this spike in the prior and so the just, just geometrically you, you end up getting um, very flaky results as Gelman really um, co compellingly showed it with, with some examples um, if the tau square is close to zero, the true tau square is close to zero. So what I mean is that if we choose epsilon um, being like 0 0.001 versus 1 times 10 to the minus 6 versus 1 times 10 to the minus 9, we might get very, very different results. Because the two true tau squares that are close to zero, the data is sort of consistent with the tau square that's, that's reasonably close to zero. The, the extent in which you sort of throw out that random effect and get sucked into this problem with near propriety is kind of dependent on, on um, exactly what epsilon is, even if it's small. It's not like, oh, it's small, then, you know, we don't have to worry about how small it is. Exactly how small it is matters. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, as, as epsilon goes to zero, as I showed in that prior, you have an increasingly huge spike near zero, and so you're going to get this really sucked, pulled in towards zero, that small random effect. And so you get, you might be interested in the random effect, and it's like 0.1, but you're estimating it as zero, or very close to zero, just because your epsilon's too small. Um, and so that's that's not good. So one, one recommended default is, um, is as follows. Yeah. Okay, so so we want to do Gibbs sampling, and so um, let let let's um, let's look at the posterior for an improper default prior. And so this is now this is now the joint posterior. Before I was showing the posterior for mu one to mu j, given these these really important hyperparameters. And so now now we'd like to um, we'd like to do sort of full posterior inference. And so we have the likelihood of the data given everything, and then we have the um, we have the uh, the product over each of the schools of the, or the baseball players of the of the conditional prior for the, the school specific means, and so this is just normal. These are just Gaussians. 
Um, and so that, that's just as before um, in, in, in looking at a derivation for the conditional posterior given these quantities. But now we also have the, uh, the prior for the overall mean and then the, these two variance components. Okay, and so um, so it's just going to be just a bunch of nor normal updating things, and so the um, for our for our three pieces, if we break it into the three pieces, the likelihood part is just going to be a product over schools, product over students within schools of a of a normal piece, and then we just throw out the two pi part because it's just a constant, and then the uh, the part for the school specific means is again just the normal. Um, and then the variance component there, is, uh, which is controlling the variation across schools, is this um, B mu, which is the precision in, in, in across schools. And then it's just center of mu. And then, and then this part right here, this is just the, uh, this, the normal um, prior on mu, is just um, proportional or constant because we're using a, an improper default prior. And then we have these um, priors for these other two components where um, you can see for the fee, we just use the usual default priors, one over fee. But we did do one over fee for fee mu because we do that. That 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 improper prior leads to a um, improper posterior, so we do this modification. Okay, so we're we're doing the same type of prior, but for uh, for for a transformation. Yeah, and so it's just this just avoids that trap around zero. You know, mathematically, it avoids us blowing up right around zero and in, in calculating the normalizing constant. Okay. Um, so if we tried to obtain everything in closed form, you're sort of up the creek um, because it's not not like because of the hierarchical structure. Each part of the hierarchical structure, conditionally on other parts, is incredibly simple and just normal um, type pieces that, that we can't just get a joint posterior for all of these things. We can get a joint posterior for these, given these, and then given these, we can sort of break these apart, but we can't break them all apart together, and so we, we need to do some sort of Gibbs sampling. And we can do something else and so some other approximation, but it's natural to do Gibbs sampling. And so for Gibbs sampling, we need the full conditional distributions, and so we could, um, we could sample from the full conditional distributions for each of the uh, each of the school-specific means, and so that, this is nice because they're all conditionally independent, um, given the grand mean, the mu. Okay, so these are just going to be sampling from a bunch of normals um, using exactly the form I showed at the beginning, which was the conditional posterior for mu j's, given the other ones. Okay, and then we um, we sample the from the the posterior distribution for mu um, conditionally on everything else. We sample from the posterior distribution for phi, given everything else, and the phi mu, given everything else. Okay, and so um, yeah. So if you really, if you, if you look at the full conditional distributions, then actually they're not dependent on all of these things. You could write them in a simpler form. Okay. So from from the first part of the lecture, um, which was last class. <laughs> We've broken our class into two, yeah. and so we have we have this. So that was the form of the, the joint posterior distribution for for mu one to mu capital J, given our population parameters is just all normal. This is what we talked about with the sort of shrinkage um, towards the sample mean and then the, the variance using information. Um, so we just we've rewritten it in terms of our new parameters now. Before we had slightly different parameters, and we've used these new parameters. Uh, because it's convenient in terms of um, um, doing the updating from gamma distributions and using uh, default priors that are simple. And so if we use the original parameters, it'd be much more complicated to write down. But it's the same. It's the same form. And so you could look at this and look at the beginning, the, the notes from the beginning of class, and match them. Um, okay. And so we we have this uniform. It's a, like a uniform and proper prior in the whole real line for mu. Um, and that gives us a particularly straightforward um, form. And so we can easily put in information and it would just be a slightly more complicated form. But you, you go through and then you get the, the, the posterior distribution is, is just really exactly what you would expect. So it's just going to be a normal. And so what's the, uh, what's the, the um, it's just the, the average of the means, 
Okay. And then the, the variance is, and so in this case, he's you're making he's making a um, a simplifying assumption that the um, the sample sizes are the same in each school. Okay. But you know, if you didn't do that, what would happen here? It would just be a weighted average weighted by the sample size in the school. And so if, if I was a school, if we had a school with five students, then we would multiply the the, the mean um, by five. And so that, that would be quite easy. And so, um, yeah. Okay. That's not true. Sorry. I said stupid things. Yeah, so it's not. This is right. Because um, it, the, the information about the different size schools comes in, in, into the MUJs. And so the MUJs are going to move around more. A MUJs are going to move around more if there's less students in that school. The conditional for mu doesn't involve y at all. Okay, Because conditionally on... Because if we look at the posterior distribution, we have um, we have this hierarchical structure where we have we have the, the, the population parameters, which are the overall mean uh, across all the schools, the two variance components, and then we have the, the means specific to each school. Well, they're sampled from a normal centered on the the grand mean mu. Okay, so mu doesn't come directly into the likelihood for the y's at all. And so that, that's a really a big simplification. So if we go back um, here, then uh, you can see that if we're, let's, we're driving the, the conditional post here for mu, um, mu doesn't come in here at all. So, so, so the data is conditionally independent of mu given the mu j's. Okay? So if we're, if we're updating from the posterior distribution for mu, the overall mean across the schools, well, that's just going to be, um, it only comes in here, you know? And so that um, might be concerning because it seems like the data aren't informing at all about mu, but, the, well, the data inform a lot about the mu, j, mu1 through mu j, and so that information comes in about mu. But um, it can cr cause mixing problems when you're, when you're updating something not depending on the data because clearly uh, mu j's and the mu are going to be very, very highly um, correlated in the posterior. Okay, and so um, so yeah, so when we're updating mu, that this just falls out, and then we just have this piece, and now we just rewrite it as a posterior for mu, and we just get this. So that's just the average of the mu's for each school, um, and then and then we just have the uh, that 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 variance in the means across the school. That's one over phi mu because phi mu is the precision, and then we. We have that number of schools, okay? so that's our sample size. It's just it's exactly the conditional. If we were calculating the, the the conditional for the mean, if we had j draws from a normal distribution, that was our data. It's exactly the same. But it, our draws, instead of being the data, they're the school specific means. Okay, and so what about the um, the precision in the uh, characterizing the vari variability across schools. Okay, so well now we can see well that comes in. Where does that come in? If we go back to the um, original posterior expression, which I won't, won't do, but you could go back yourself. Then it's going to come come in the the, the the again not directly in the likelihood. There's no, no, nowhere in the likelihood that this variation across the school specific means comes in, that just comes in the likelihood for the mu j's. And those are sort of like data, random effects in some sense. And so that's our, our, our latent data. And so this is our, our latent data likelihood. And that's where it comes in. And then this is the part for the prior, our sort of default prior, which was shifted a little bit from the usual prior um, so we don't get this impropriety problem, trap at uh, zero. Um, okay, and then so we just go through this, and we're gonna we know we're gonna end up with a gamma because we have like b mu to something power, and we e to the minus b times something. Um, and so the full conditional for b mu is again um, quite intuitive, and so we have um, j minus one over two. And so this is this is going to be slightly different than if we if we started with a gamma prior for phi mu. And then we, we went to zero because then, then we won't have this minus, um, we have minus one. We won't have minus three halves. Okay? The reason we're doing the minus three halves is to avoid the problem with impro proper posterior. And so for that reason, um, instead of getting j plus one half, 
which is what we would get um, with, with, with the usual prior. We, we've, we've cleverly shifted the prior to put in this minus 3 half instead of minus 1. And so now instead of plus 1 half, it becomes minus 1 half. Okay. But otherwise, it's just exactly the same as what, what, what we would get if we were um, update, if we had data directly from one normal, in this case our data are UJs, and, and we had a, um, an unknown, um, a, we were conditioning on the mean of that normal, but we didn't know the precision. And we had a, an, an improper prior, um, Jeffrey's prior, we would get this exactly, but it would be plus one. And now we modify that prior to be minus three halves, and then we get minus one. And so that, that's pretty cool that um, you can just do that minor little trick, and it'll make all the difference. And now we get a proper posterior. Our GIF sampler is going to converge to something. We get sensible inferences, um, whereas if we had plus one there, it would all be garbage. Okay, and so the, this is the fee. This is the precision of the of, of, uh, uh, characterizing the one over the variance of, of, of the variability in, of students within a school. Okay. So there's two variance components. One's across schools, one's within schools. This is the, the within school precision. Okay. And so in this one, we, the data are definitely going to come in. And we have, um, we have the likelihood part, which is right here. And then we have the usual Jeffrey's prior, the 1 over fee, okay? which we didn't use for one uh, view because of the propriety problem. But we can use it um, here because we don't have, we're sort of tied down by the data in this component. And we don't have that trap at zero um, for the random effect. Because we know that the data have some variability in them. Because we can see the data. Unlike the mu j's, we can't see them, and so we could potentially set them all equal to each other. And that, that's what causes the trap. Okay? And so, so this is just going to be just completely the, um, the easy thing to go through we get. So this is just the, uh, the sample size over 2, and then the sum of squared residuals over 2. OK, and so that's, um, we're, we're exactly done on time, and so um, let me just comment a little bit on this. And so, so we're doing this is this the first step in hierarchical modeling. The point of the hierarchical modeling is to borrow information across the, the schools and estimating these school specific effects. We can also do inferences on these population parameters, which are the, the, the mean across all of the schools. We can we can get a credible interval for that. We can say things about that. Also, these two variance components describing the variability among students within schools and between schools and the mean performance, okay? And so the hierarchical model is really powerful um, in allowing us to do those inferences and, and then really borrowing information. That borrowing can be very strong, particularly if there's not an enor enormous number of, of students in each school that are sort of swamping out the shrinkage effect, and if there's not that much variation across the schools. But it, it, as we get into hierarchical modeling, we need to be very much more careful about the priors, particularly if we if we're want to take an objective Bayes approach and avoid putting in um, information in our prior. Often, in my view, that's a bad idea because putting in a, using a proper prior, um, even a weakly informative prior that's sort of tying down, um, putting in high posterior density and prior density in some reasonable range, but even a modestly large range, that's going to tend to improve performance re relative to using one of these kind of improper priors. Um, but of course, if you use a, a, an improper prior, you need to have your posterior be proper. So I'll stop there. And again, so one more class with no homework assignment, but you should be wor working on your project. So everyone should like, you have your data, and now you're like writing down models, and you're trying to start to figure out how to analyze the data. You're like to that point now, or you're behind. <laughs> <laughs> Probably everyone's behind. <laughs>